Welcome back, everyone, to Black Hat 2021, live with Security Weekly from G-Unit Studios here in Rhode Island. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian. Joining me for this micro interview is Sonali Shah, Chief Product Officer at Invicti Security. Welcome, Sonali. Hey, Paul. Thanks for having me. It's nice to have you today. Uh, and we're talking about shifting left, which, as you believe, and I'm going to be honest, I agree with you, uh, can leave you vulnerable. So I guess first, Sonali, what, what do, when we say shifting left, I think that means a lot of different things to a lot of people. What do we mean when we say in security shifting left? Yeah, you, you know, it's the concept of securing your applications earlier in the software development cycle. So as early as in the IDE, almost having like spell checkers find vulnerabilities in code um, and starting as early as possible, because the reality is, is the earlier, the faster you find the vulnerability, the cheaper and easier it is to fix. Do you think that also plays into the design and kind of architecture phases as well? Or is yeah, that actually, that's a really good point. In fact, I would take it even further left and say that in, you know, in colleges or in schools where they're teaching mm. software development, they should be teaching how you secure uh, how you write secure code. Um, so if I could, if I had it my way, I'd shift all the way left to to where the developers are taught to code to begin with. I, I feel like it's a it's a nice game plan and it works out some of the time. But you can take the sports analogy, like you've got this game plan that you put together. Like here's how we're going to do things. But then when you get into the thick of things, you don't always follow the game plan. And I feel like that happens in software development too. Yeah. No. No. I I, I absolutely agree. I think you know this. If you think about sort of the history of of application security, right? Generally, people would start in the middle, maybe a DAS scan just before releasing, mm -hmm. and then manual penetration testing. You know, once a year. Um, and you know, they they tried a lot of enterprises tried to secure more apps, but at the time, the right te the technologies weren't there. Right? It was just it was too slow, too many false positives, not integrated uh, in the DevOps tool chain. And then a couple of years ago, you had this huge sort of swing on shifting left and tools like SaaS that were, you know, faster, a uh, little bit better integrated, uh, still a lot of false positives. But in theory, this concept of finding and fixing early makes makes perfect sense, right? Mm -hmm. um, in reality, I think it, it doesn't work for a couple of reasons. First of all, you're ignoring everything on the right. So most companies have thousands of apps out there that they're not actively developing, right? And so you're you're missing those with the with the shift left. Um, the other thing is, if you think about and you know this as as a developer, um, you know the pro developer's primary focus is to get code out quickly that does what it's supposed to do, right? Mm -hmm. So the functionality is really important. Security is just something that slows it down, right? Um, and so you, there's just this pressure to release really quickly. Um, so that makes the whole shift left difficult. You know, there's also still generally a lot of false positives, um, not enough qualified staff. I was just talking about developers not learning about security um, and not enough security tools folks out there. You know, as we all know, it takes forever to, to hire security folks these days, not enough security folks to really help out the developers resolve the problems. Um, so for all of these reasons, um, you know, definitely I would recommend everybody shift left and do, you know, security uh, early in the dev cycle, but don't forget about the the right and the majority of your apps that you're, that are not in live development or are third party apps that you don't even own the code to, right? You, you, you need then to be able to scan those as well. Yeah. It's interesting. Also, it, when you identify a bug that it could be a vulnerability in software, it's difficult to determine in that phase when we're on the left if that can really be exploited or not. And I think that's the advantage you have with scanning is you, you know because I exploited it, right? But right. as a developer, I'd look at the recommendations from my IDE and it would go, this is, this is vulnerable, or using a vulnerable library. I'm like, but I never call the method that, right. was, that was vulnerable. And, yeah, I'm using that library, but it was only that one method in that library that was vulnerable, and I never call that one. And right. tools sometimes have a difficult time figuring that out. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, one of the things um, that actually a lot of the tools, of course, 
our tool in particular, but a lot of tools have gotten really better at is, um, I mean, it's still an issue, but gotten better at the false positives. I mean, one of the things that we did very early on is this concept of proof-based scanning. So we're actually showing you that this is exploitable. Um, and you can do that with DAST, you can do that with IAST, with a lot of the SEA tools now in the market as well, you can tell if that vulnerability will actually be, uh, is actually exploitable. So we are, we are getting better, but your, your point is still very much the case. Yeah. And the priority is often interesting aspect. When you look at in your IDE, it would give me like this huge list of issues, right? It was like a little button, like go check. And then it would check all of these things and not just for security, but like for good coding practices and it would prioritize them. And it's overwhelming as a developer to look at those. And then oftentimes like you look at some of the medium ones and you're like, that that's really not an issue. But a medium level vulnerability in a priority uh, severity sense from a scanner, that's something that I want to go, I want to go fix, you know, versus when it could be sitting in the code. Right. Absolutely. It's, it's tough to be a developer these days. There's a, there's a lot of pressure to innovate quickly, build the right thing. It should function as proper uh, as expected, but then also needs to be secured, right? You don't want to be that developer that put your company on the front page of the New York Times. Yeah. Yeah, that's it's it's really hard to because like you said, I think developers are prioritizing functionality and and that's hard enough. And having the the time to go through and remediate vulnerabilities, which you're also kind of unsure at that point is like, am I remediating the right vulnerabilities? Um, so what on the kind of scanning side, um, what do you do to help with the prioritization, you know, kind of above and beyond exploitation? Is there like a process or how are you uh, prioritizing? Yeah. So, you know, the, the, I think just first of all, accuracy is hugely important, right? So that when we find something and for 95% of high severity vulnerabilities, we are able to provide the proof. So when we provide proof, customers know, all right, absolutely, you've got to fix this, right? So we're, we allow customers to say, all right, if it's a high or medium severity vulnerability, Invicti's found, give, is giving you the proof of exploit, immediately open a, a, a JIRA ticket and make sure the developer takes care of it, right? And if it's a really high severity vulnerability, and if it's an application that has access to sensitive information or it's taking credit card information, right? Then, you know, don't even, don't even let it be released. Um, so I think, you know, that plays a really big part um, one of the things we're, we're looking at doing also is bringing in this concept of true risk, right? And you you, you talked about that. Um, will it actually be exploited? And I think so. Some of the things we're we're looking at leveraging, you know, obviously years of scan data, machine learning, things like that, is understanding the context of the application. So looking at the severity, all right, it's high severity vulnerability, but if it's on a page that has, doesn't have access to sensitive information, maybe it's not so important to stop the release, right? So accuracy is one part of it, but the other layer that we are starting now to work on is how do you also bring in this concept of exploitability and the importance of the asset, right? Does anyone actually care about uh, breaching it? And I think that'll bring another layer of um, prioritization. Does that make sense? No, it certainly does, especially when you look at cross-site scripting as an example, which, you know, I think for a long time, and there's still tools out there today that kind of treat cross-site scripting as a certain severity type. But mm -hmm. as you and I and many know, that could really not be an issue, right? right. Or there's other limiting factors in, in how do you take that into account in your uh, process because you don't want all your developers fixing every instance of cross-site scripting equally when that one may require that you're that you're logged in with a certain privilege level in order right. to access that you know I saw that and when I was like there's a cross-site scripting here I'm like yeah but I got to be logged in as admin in order to even run the exploit you know against it and you know who has control of that data over which point I think greatly affects the severity of something like a cross-site scripting Exactly. And understanding that context, right? So I think the the way, and it's any type of risk, whether it's financial risk or cybersecurity risk, understanding the concept, or the context of the risk 
is so important, right? Like you're buying life insurance, right? You're looking at the age of the person. Do they have kids? Do they have, you know, heart conditions? Like, so mm-hmm. all of these things that are around the, the context of where the application is, the context of how the vulnerability would be exploited, all of that needs to come into play so that you are really prioritizing true risk and you're not just trying to just fix everything. Right. Does that come in with other, uh, you know, vulnerability types? So like, I guess, do you pull in data from like recently I was reading uh, the CWE common weaknesses and exposures, right? And there's one for web vulnerabilities as well that kind of go through uh, Mm -hmm. each of the types and like, do you take that into account from external sources as well? Yes, we do. It's really important that we, we, we look at, we've got external sources we're looking at, and then we've got our own, you know, because we offer both on-prem and cloud, um, we've get a lot of data just from scanning thousands of times mm-hmm. a day, right? That we're also able to use. And is, do you crowdsource some of that? Like, do you get one that, you know, in this certain scenario, people have kind of marked this as a lower priority uh, versus the one that maybe comes out of the box? So do you, are you able to crowdsource some of that data? It, we are because our customers are integrated with us completely, right? So we've got some customers who aren't integrated at all, but we've got a lot of customers who are integrating us. So we we see, you know, we know when when uh, the build occurs, a scan is kicked off, right? We see when tickets are open. We see when they're closed. We see when someone is changing the severity of it, mm-hmm. right? So we just have all of this data about how, um, you know, customers are are uh, what they're doing with scan results, and we're able to use that to continuously make our engine better. Yeah, that's awesome. There's so many different uh, web frameworks out there, languages. You know, all of that plays into the severity. It, how do you take that into account? You know, given that we talk about cross-site scripting as an example, but that presents itself differently based on how the application is put together, what language they're using, frameworks, protocols, all that stuff. You have to take that all into consideration, correct? I think that's, you know, one of the things that we're really starting to focus on is we've got years of data that tell us sort of what what is really exploitable, right? Where are the um, you know, what what uh looking at the the framework, the language, right? What are the things that really should be prioritized? And We've got, so of course we've got our own, you know, research, security research team looking at a lot of these things, but then we've also got a data science team looking at how do we make sense of all of this data to make our recommendations much more accurate and and more importantly, actionable, so you know what to do with it. Yeah. Do you find that it, it, some of it is code and some of it is configuration? Uh, and oh, yeah. You, you balance the two, correct? Yes, absolutely. And there's a lot you can observe from outside, as you well know. Um, without breaking into anybody's network, just to see how they're configuring things and have they configured them properly, right? Right. Yeah. The, the web server certainly comes into play when we talk about redirect attacks and things like that. And that, yeah. and that's like you know maybe the I mean, do the developers even have control of that? It depends on the environment. Right. Right. Yeah. And I, I think you know one of the things with security is we've been really kind of siloed, right? So a lot of point solutions, whether it's, you know, with an AppSec, you've got SAS, DAST, IAST, you've got network vulnerability management, you've got WAFs. And I think, like, when I think of what is the next generation of AppSec, I think it's going to be a world where there, it is an alphabet soup. It is actually tying in all of these various, um, I would say various testing engines and the context that of that mm-hmm. particular customer to produce much more meaningful results. I think that's really where the industry needs to go um, to really, really help customers secure. I feel like right now we're just spending a lot of money on all these different tools, but because we're not looking at everything together and tying it into the to the to the real life context, we're as an industry, just producing a whole lot of alerts that are really difficult for our customers to prioritize. Well, at what point in in the development process do you recommend people do scanning? And I know it's a difficult question to answer because people have different, you know, uh, ways of chaining all that stuff together, right? Like, yeah. do you do it when like the the developer make a build and then it gets scanned, or does it? go to QA? Does QA even really exist today, right? Does it go up to staging, right? Do you wait till it's in production? Probably not. Maybe. Like where in the the stages do you do this testing? 
I think, um, look, you know, if you follow the sort of what people are saying about shift lift, then doing it as early as possible, it, it makes sense to the extent that it's, if it's a real vulnerability, it's cheapest, right? Fastest, right. cheapest to it there. I think the, you know, with the CICD, what, what makes sense doing it there is with the combination of DAST and IAST, you're able to see sort of outside in, inside out, and and really be able to identify with accuracy that things are exploitable. And so we recommend starting there because it um, it sort of it gives you results that developers can trust. What happens we see is when you start really early on, you've got all these inaccuracies, you start losing the trust of the teams. Mm. Um, and that's a really big issue because once you've lost the trust, developers are thinking, all right, why should I, why should I believe these guys? Right. Last two times I tried it turned out to be false positives. I wasted all this time. Um, so I think in there with the testing tools that we have today, kind of in the CICD pipeline, I think is, is the place where you can really get enough good information to identify the, the vulnerabilities and identify them accurately. Um, but you can't stop there, right? There's so many applications that either you haven't developed in-house um, or you're not actively developing, even if the, you do own the code. So I think you you need to, it's got to be continuous, right? It's got to mm-hmm. be continuous. Um, and we, you know, I, I was really surprised recently heard uh, a very large bank um, scanning almost daily, right? Which in the past was sort of unheard with, with DAST and, and, and of course now IS is there as well before it was like once a year, but we've got, we've got people doing it, you know, uh, you know, daily, weekly, um, that, that the time of doing it in production once a year is just gone. People yeah. realize it's not enough. And it sounds like you scan every environment, right? I'm kind of a fan of that because, you know, the whole like works on my machine kind of thing. And I think if you've got, development (laughs) staging and production that even vulnerabilities can be different and even though you think well it's the same code running you know in development staging and in production at a a certain point um but you know in production has this vulnerability but we didn't see that in staging because production's configured slightly differently maybe there's some redundancy and elastic and things like that right so is it is important to scan all of your environments regularly it, it absolutely is. Um, I think I'm forgetting which breach it was. Was it JP Morgan where it was a application that was like signing up for some marathon or something, right? They were taking signups and it was mm-hmm. through that site that the this company was breached. Do you remember which one I'm talking about? Uh, I don't recall. So many breaches. <laughs> I know. So it, it was just like the example though is, is it's an application that no one thinks is important, right? Mm-hmm. And you know, the security team may not even know that it's up there. Somebody just probably put it up there. It's a sign up, you know, sign up here and join this marathon or race or whatever it was they were, they were, um, but somehow somebody was able to attack that and get in to the systems and, you know, still a bunch of sensitive data. So it's, you need to, to secure as many apps as you can. Yeah. That's interesting. How do you, how do you balance the speed? Like when you have hundreds or thousands of applications and you're you want to run DAST against them, mm-hmm. I think the first pushback you might uh, come up against is, well, how do I scan those in a reasonable amount of time? How do yeah. you how do you performance tune that? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's it's an excellent question. Um, so our scan times are kind of two to two to four hours. I would say is the range. Um, for full scans. But then there, we also do incremental scans, which mm-hmm. are just a few minutes, right? You're looking at just what has changed. So I, I think that it's unrealistic to say that, you know, you've got to wait two, three hours for the four, if it's a full scan, um, to wait for it to finish, fix everything, and then release it, right? Because we get back to that whole concept of, you know, developers under pressure to release quickly. So I think there's a balance. And there's a time where you, it, you know, it, it's been prioritized. It's high severity. The application is has access to sensitive data, and you've got to stop deployment and fix it. But when I think of speed, I don't just think of speed of the engine. I think of, of 
time that the vulnerability is left open as, mm-hmm. is really important as well. So if you've got a fast ask scanner, which is also accurate, and you've got all the workflows integrated, then even if you do release something in the wild, you're shrinking the time that it's actually exploitable. Right. So even if you, you know, say that the scan takes two to three hours, it gets so, you know, and then it, the ticket goes to the developer, they say, this is what you've got to fix. You know, maybe it's out in the open for six hours, 12 hours, maybe even a day. Right. But it's no, it no longer has to be the months or years that we've seen in the past. So I think, you know, you can't sacrifice it. it you can make the scan speed much less, but then you're sacrificing quality. So I think it's it's really a balance, but at the at the end of the day, it's I think the real goal. While we would love it to be no vulnerabilities in production, the reality is it's not going to happen, mm. right? So let's try and minimize the vulnerabilities in production, and then for the vulnerabilities that are in production, let's try and minimize the time that they're exposed. Yeah, it's an interesting balance, right? Uh, how quickly so you've implemented DevOps in the CSED pipeline, you can push code out faster. But right. you can also introduce more vulnerabilities more quickly. But the other side of that is you can also fix them more quickly. Okay, and, and I agree right. with your assessment. It's about shrinking that window, right? Right. So you know there's going to be vulnerable code in production, but you know you can fix it much more yeah. quickly than fix you could it before. Right. It's definitely better and- than the waterfall model. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. I don't know. Maybe life was easier for the developers. You tell me. Was life easier for you in the waterfall days? Ah, uh, for like a, a period of time, like it was a, a false perception, like things would be great because, you know, you push that release and yeah, they found bugs and you're working on them, but production is happy until there's a breach or some catastrophic, uh, you know, failure, right? I mean, a lot of these issues that we're fixing, yes, could be vulnerabilities, but could also impact reliability, performance, and uptime of the site. And so like you you basically have a month where you think everything's great and then one really bad day kind of erases that whole month that you spend in the the waterfall cycle, right? Yeah. You know, I've never been a developer um, and you certainly don't want me developing any of your code. But I, I, you know, just my perspective is, is it's really tough because we, it's not just like vulnerabilities that, um, you know, you you might lose some some data. There might be you know political fallout or or you know reputational fallout. This is the way. This is the next. It, like forget nuclear weapons, right? It's cyber war now, mm. right? This is the next wave of weapons, and we're putting developers out there to build stuff that we know is going to be insecure, and we know that the the attackers are only getting more and more sophisticated because this is all they do all day long right so i feel like it's such an unfair match here where you've got developers who were asking to secure code and then you've got the adversary which is no longer just some guy in his basement it could be the whole nation of china or russia right it's it's such an it's such an imbalance um today and we've got to get the tools and the technologies right um, and implement it correctly if we're ever going to win this race. Yeah, because it comes down to resources too, right? You talk about nation states that they're devoting their resources to finding and exploiting vulnerabilities. When you look right. at your your dev teams today, their primary focus is functionality. And mm-hmm. to go back and do security, you've got to spend some resources on that. And balancing that is, is very, very tricky. I know it's one thing I struggled with in our internal app was... Yeah, like I know we need to go to Python 3 because we're on Python 2, but that means we all have to take a time out right? and focus on these things and not fixing bugs or implementing features. So, you know, to your point, developers are already at a disadvantage. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I was just talking to one of our customers today and he was talking about this concept of tech debt. Mm. He's like, everyone thinks about tech debt as all right, you know, you're, you, you're, you've got a monolith, you need to mic- move to microservices, right? Or you need to upgrade to the, the latest version of whatever. Um, but he's like, I actually see security as tech debt. And that's why it's really important to continuously be scanning and fixing um, and taking that pause. And this particular customer that I'm thinking of um, has, so his company has been breached in the past. And so I think that has changed the attitude. And 
the uh, you know, he and his, his, the whole management team of this very large company is sort of understanding, all right, we need to think of security as important as, you know, we need to think of it as ongoing tech, tech debt that we have to figure out how to solve. And we've got to make sure that's just as important as constantly releasing new apps and innovating. Um, otherwise, we're going to be breached again. And sadly, it took a huge breach for that to happen. But yeah. the sort of finally thinking along those lines. And I think that just a lot of companies aren't there yet. Yeah, I, I really think that breaches really underscore the tech debt problem. And oftentimes, although it's sad that there was a breach, right? But breed that hygiene where mm -hmm. you're not waiting around to go fix a bunch of security issues, that it's part of the process and you're finding and fixing things as you go. I find that to be, you know, I often equate that to my home where I've got to do proactive maintenance so that I can uh, not have that disaster in the future. I think we need to look at software uh, and how we secure our networks and systems in the same way, that keeping up with all of that hygiene, which is why I think it's important to, yes, give developers tools when they're developing code or designing to do it securely, uh, but also find those at various stages and have that cycle where you are constantly fixing and doing things. Yeah, it really is co continuously scanning, con continuously improving. Um, and it's just like we do with the quality of the apps and the functionality we expect from the apps, right? We're continuously improving. Security just needs to be a part of that. You know, it needs to be really embedded. Uh, you know, if, if folks like me in, in, you know, on the vendor side, if we are successful, like when I think about AppSec, right, if I'm successful, there should be no more DAS, SAS, IAS, SCA, RAS, whatever the new AST is, mm -hmm. right? Forget that alphabet soup. We should be able to offer enterprises one platform that is so smart, right? Whether it's using machine learning or AI or whatever, that can they can understand what that app is. What is the intended functionality of it? What is the technology stack it's on? And when should it be scanned? automatically trigger those and tell you what needs to be fixed when, right? And I think we as vendors are sort of making it even harder when we have all of these different technologies. So the developer has to learn how to use all of these, right? And we need to weave, if again, we're successful in security, which I hope we are, I hope there's no such thing as an AppSec security company, right? It should just be, it's part of all your development tools. Um, that's the only way I feel like we're really going to be able to get ahead of this. Yeah. And I, I feel, Sonali, I feel like accuracy is a huge part of that because that means your developers are, regardless of priority and severity, are fixing actual problems. It may not be a problem today, but, you know, hey, maybe that library isn't even vulnerable today, but guess what? It's out of date. And if it's in your process to fix that, when that vulnerability comes out in that library, you've already updated it or you've already know how to update it and it's easier to go from version 1.2 to 1.3, not so much to go from version 0.7 all the way up, right? That's why I think hygiene, continuous scanning and continuous development is so important. Yeah, yeah. You know, on that accuracy point, it's not only important for your internal development teams. Um, one of our customers has been having this problem where they they they're scanning the third-party apps, they show them the proof, and they're like, no, this is not ours. No, we didn't do this. And so that mm. that's an issue with, that we have with kind of when you're scanning third-party apps. Um, and they found that the first few times the vendors were like, you know, no, no, this is not ours. We didn't, we didn't introduce this vulnerability. You show the proof, you show here's the line of code. This is right. what you need to fix it. Over time, they've been able to gain the trust. So it's not just gaining trust with your own security teams, but it's also gaining the trust of your partners in the supply chain so that you don't just, you don't end up with this finger pointing, you end up with, you know, cooperation and working together to fix things. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I often feel like developers too, even, oh, like that's not my code. That's another library or it's a Tomcat server that needs to be updated. And that's not my, I, I need to write new code. I don't need to spend time you know, upgrading a version, which could force you to update code as well. It's an interesting, you know, kind of relationship. When we look at all, like you said, the supply chain and all the components that make up your application, you may not write the code for all of them, right? Yeah. But you're still responsible for them. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a tough job. Uh, but I think we're, we're, we're getting there. The industry is getting better. We're 
building better tools. And um, I, I do think that we, we, we just, technology is changing so quickly. And um, the emphasis that I'm seeing in, you know, I've been in cybersecurity now for years and the emphasis that I'm seeing men, you know, from CEO boards putting on cybersecurity is starting to, you know, make an impact. And I think it's got to come from, you know, executive teams have to be focused on cybersecurity and seeing that as a real risk. And at the same time, the technology, the solution providers need to improve and provide tools that are accurate, fast, and automated within whatever else the developers are using. Um, and then I think that's the only way we're really going to move forward. So now you're speaking at uh, Black Hat on, yeah. on this topic. Yeah. What, and so just tell me a little bit about your talk and what people can expect so they can go check it out. Yeah, it's exactly about this. The title is, um, I think, The Great Overcorrection and Why You Need to Shift Left and Shift Right. And we just sort of talk through you know, what are the, you know, what, what are the reasons why shift left makes sense, but what is it that you're missing with, with the shift left and what are sort of some best practices on how you can really protect your entire uh, application service. So yes, would, would welcome your viewers, please come watch the talk. Um, if you're not able to do that, stop by our booth. Uh, we'd, we'd love to chat more and I would love to just meet more and more people and understand their experiences so we can improve uh, our products at Invicti. Fantastic. So, Nolly, thank you so much. Yeah, Paul, will you be there at Black Hat? I will not. I will be attending virtually. <laughs> All right. Well, well, thank you for your time. Hope to see you again soon. Thank you. For folks All who right. want to learn more, you can visit securityweekly.com forward slash NetSparker.